Hello. Uh, I'm going to present the results we have so far in the research we are doing uh, about uh, probabilistic models uh, inspired in music and physics for audio content analysis. <coughs> this is the content of the presentation. Uh, because the proposed model is based on random processes, uh, I, uh, I'm going to introduce what's uh, this concept, um, <coughs> uh, specifically uh, Gaussian processes. Then uh, uh, I try to clarify how to link or how to make a relation between the Gaussian processes and music signals. Uh, after that, uh, I present the definition of the model we are, we are developing um, uh, for audio content analysis and how, uh, how we estimate the parameters of this model. Uh, we will see in the, in the speech that uh, the most important part in a Gaussian process model is the kernel or the covariant function. That's why we focus on how to choose or how to build a proper kernel. Uh, we will study different properties of the signals we want to, to describe, like non-stationarity, uh, rich spectral content, and um, time dynamics. Uh, finally, uh, I present some results uh, and outcomes of experiments doing synthetic and real uh, audio data. Um, finally, uh, I, I talk about uh, future work. Okay, so... Uh, most of the concepts uh, that I'm going to introduce in the introduction, uh, I learned them or I, clarify, I made them clear uh, when I went to the Gaussian Process Summer School uh, last September in Sheffield University. Uh, here is, there is a link if you want <coughs> to read uh, more about it. There is uh, code available and also all the lectures are available in video. So, uh, I, I start defining the concept of a random process. Uh, instead of making a mathematical rigorous description of what is a, uh, sorry, a random process, uh, we can make a, an analogy. So, suppose we have a dice with a lot of sides, and in each side we have the plot of a function. So, every time we roll the dice, we get a different function. A different plot. Uh, <coughs> uh, a random process is said is said to be Gaussian if uh, any finite set of function evaluations, in this case the vector f, is multivariate uh, normal distributed. So. Uh, We can see a function as an infinite length vector. Um, if we choose, if we select a finite number of these variables or, or a, a, a finite number of components of this infinite vector, um, we assume that that uh, vector has a, a normal distribution, then we assume that that function follows a Gaussian process. So we, we can, we can uh, discard all the other function evaluations and focus only in the, in the vector we, we, are, we want to work with. Um, as we assume that this vector follows a normal distribution, we can see this as a draw or a realization of that distribution. Then we can draw other, we can draw or sample more vectors and, and make a plot like this. A Gaussian process is uh, completely specified by uh, a main function and a covariant function of our kernel. In this case, uh, m, mt corresponds to the main function and k, t, t prime corresponds to the covariant function. And using the definition of AGP, uh, now we know that the vector f will follow a multivariate uh, normal distribution. Uh, it's important to clarify that the way that we, uh, or 
what we use to calculate the covariant function of, the, of this multivariate uh, normal distribution is the covariant function. So the value uh, of this matrix at uh, row i and column j corresponds to evaluate the function, the, the covariance function, uh, and in those different instances of time. Uh, one uh, well known covariance function is the square exponential. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, one of the reasons, because this is quite used, uh, is because this covariance covariance function uh, allows to describe uh, smooth functions with which are uh, um, which you can differ differentiate uh, an infinite quantity of times. So the structure of the covariant function reflects the properties of the of the of the random process. So we choose the kernel accordingly with what we believe about the properties of the data. Uh, here we have four, four realizations of a Gaussian process using the uh, square exponential <coughs> kernel. We see that the, this function, these functions are smooth uh, and stationary. Uh, on the other side, we have uh, four realizations of a Gaussian process using this covariant function. We see that the properties of these uh, other functions are different to these ones. Here we can see uh, that there is a periodicity. Uh, there is a, a natural frequency and some, some harmonics. <clears throat> so it is, it's quite important to have clear that the covariance function reflects uh, the properties of the function we are trying to model. If, uh, if we see music as a, as a random process, then we can make an analogy as before. Uh, Suppose we have again a dice with a lot of sides, and every time we roll, and, and sorry, and in every side of the dice we have uh, a music function. So every time we roll the dice, we get something like maybe a guitar chord or a piano melody, a dubstep beat or a bass melody. Uh, let's uh, make a zoom in in a small section of this function. So this is a continuous object because the, uh, the air pressure vibrations and at a specific point in the space uh, produced by an in a music instrument is a continuous phenomenon. But when we made a, an audio recording, what we do is to observe at a certain instance of time that, uh, co that uh, continuous phenomenon. Uh, here, the Gaussian process appears by assuming that any finite vector of observation, I mean every, every music signal, follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution. <coughs> As I said before, uh, the kernel allows to introduce in the model all the knowledge and belief we have about the properties of the data. And we know that some properties or some characteristics of music signals are that they are not stationary. I mean, uh, th that, that means that uh, the way the observation relates to each other depends on time. Our change in time is not, we don't have the same, the same behavior in one section of the audio in comparison with other one, depending, depending on which note or instrument are we playing or using. Uh, also, the other characteristic is that there is a rich spectral content. If we, ma if we make uh, uh, a, frequency, a time frequency uh, representation of this audio signal, we will find that uh, locally there are a, 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 stationary, a stationary structure where we find uh, a specific <coughs> <coughs> a specific um, natural frequency and um, certain quantity of harmonics of harmonics. Uh, also, the other property that, that there are there is time di dynamics. I mean that uh, these functions are locally periodic and uh, they they have no constant amplitude envelope. Uh, 
other properties is that they they, um, they, they have these signals have mechanistic behavior. Uh, what we have in an audio recording of a music instrument is uh, the response of a, <laughs> a physics system to an excitation. So when, when we hit a, 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 a snare or when we uh, uh, bow a, a, a string in a violin, we are excitating a system and we are recording the response of that system. So there is a mechanistic, a mechanistic behavior present in the data also. And finally, there is uh, obviously music structure. I mean, what we are recording is the, interpre is the interpretation of a, a piece of music. So the cubings of the sound events follow some, some metric in time and some structure in frequency. Uh, here uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, a rhythm, uh, meter, tempo, uh, or beat. Uh, and also some frequencies are more likely to occur than others and that's related with uh, harmony or tonality. So because we know that the music signals that we want to model have these properties, then we need to develop or to find uh, covariant functions that can describe these properties. <coughs> the aim of uh, audio content analysis in music is to infer music concepts like pitch, melody, chords, onset, beat, tempo, rhythm, and others which are present but hidden in the audio data, in the audio signal, sorry. So here we use a Gaussian process model to uncover music concepts from audio by introducing a direct uh, connection between the model parameters and the music concepts. So at the end, when we train the model and we look at the final values of the parameters, we can make uh, a musical interpretation of those parameters. Now, uh, next I'm, I'm going to uh, present the definition of the model and how to uh, estimate the parameters, its parameters. So we, we use a non-parametric uh, regression <coughs> Okay, maybe the non-parametric is confusing because I have been thinking, I have been talking about parameters, but uh, we, we are using a non-parametric regression uh, approach using Gaussian processes. Uh, we uh, we start supposing that we have a database or n observed data D, where uh, we have the time instance uh, we observe the signal and the vector y that corresponds to the signal values at those instant of time. Uh, the, the general regression model uh, is defined in this way, and it means that we describe each observation as the evaluation of a function at the same instant of time plus some noise. Here we assume that the noise is Gaussian, and instead of using a parametric approach, I mean, instead of fixing the, the form of the function f as a polynomial or a, uh, a mixture of sines or cosines uh, and try to find those parameters. Instead, instead of doing that, we say that the function f follows a, ra a random process, here a Gaussian process. So it's a way to make more flexible the kind of functions we, want, we can use for modeling the data. Uh, assuming that each observation in you know, a vector y is independent and identi identically distributed, we can, uh, we can build the, the likelihood or the joint probability distribution of all the observations. Uh, we, we, can, we can show that uh, that distribution or that the likelihood follows, or has, sorry, uh, corresponds to a normal distribution with mean f um, an identity matrix multiplied by, by the variance or inverse precision. Uh, from, the, from the definition of the Gaussian process, we know that this vector of function values 
will have also a normal distribution. Uh, we assume a zero mean, and we calculate the matrix KF uh, by evaluating the, the kernel at different instants of time. Using a, a Bayesian approach, we are interested in calculating a posterior distribution over the latent function given our observations. And all that we need to calculate that here is to, is to, is to, is to have clear what's the likelihood and what's the prior, because using the base uh, theorem, the posterior is equal to the likelihood times the prior over the integral of the likelihood times the prior uh, and integrating over f. Um, okay, it, it can be shown that the marginal likelihood as well as the posterior are also normal distributions. <coughs> Uh, the, the marginal likelihood is also called the, the evidence. Um, it has this form. We can calculate directly this, make this integral by using the properties of the normal distributions. Uh, so we see that the marginal likelihood has a normal distribution with zero mean and a covariance matrix uh, KY, where KY is defined as the sum of the covariance matrix of the prior plus the covariance matrix of the likelihood. Also, the posterior distribution has a normal, uh, uh, is a normal distribution, and the posterior mean has this form, and the posterior uh, covariance matrix uh, is defined by this expression. Uh, from here, we can see that the most important part of the model is the covariance function, because uh, we use that kernel to calculate, to calculate uh, this matrix. Um, to calculate KY, we also need to evaluate the covariance function. So, yeah. To, uh, to optimize or to find the hyperparameters, uh, what we do is to optimize the negative log marginal likelihood. Uh, this function has this form. Um, it can be shown that the partial derivatives of this expression with respect to each of the hyperparameters uh, is defined by this expression. So if we have the function we want to optimize, um, the partial derivatives with respect to each of the parameters, hyperparameters, sorry, uh, we can use uh, any standard gradient method to optimize it. So, uh, as I said before, um, just one question. Uh, for the parameter estimation, uh, you only have one observation of the random process. Uh, you hold the die once and you've made an observation of n samples. Mm -hmm. So, are you? Is it, does it depend on the kernel? This estimation, or yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, mm. so every time we we roll the dice, we got a different y vector y, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> If we see this expression as a function of the vector y, this is a, nor is a, this is a, a Gaussian distribution. But once we have one observation, this is not anymore a random variable. That's our observation, the, the vector y we observe. And then this becomes a function of the parameters. But when you train the model, you have more than one instances of Y, right? You have many examples of the process you're trying to do. Uh, in the experiments we are running, no. You only have you take one, one, one single auto signal. And so we try to, yeah, to train the, the model using only one, one, si si one signal. But yeah. theoretically, it should be possible that the log likelihood is a summation over many possible instances of Y, right? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> 
Yeah, so I, I don't understand how you can estimate parameters from one observation unless you specify the kernel to say all samples that are two seconds, two seconds apart, three seconds apart, four seconds apart. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Mm. Maybe it'll come to me. Well, maybe, maybe I can suggest what, what, what we're trying to calculate here is the, the parameters of a general class of what we're trying to calculate um, is, is, a, is a, a possibility of leaks about this specific function of your little bit of the resonance. source of confusion that, I mean, of course you just have one sample, but this sample has a certain length, and in the sample you have certain dependencies of the sample oh, okay. caused by the kernel, so you don't have just, in a way you just have one sample, but because you have many different dependencies, so to say, and that, from that then you can try to infer the kernel. Because when you assume multivariate normal distributed, you assume that they're independent of the time map. All you're estimating are the parameters of the covariance. have one time series for training. Um, but we are trying to, to uncover of those of that time uh, audio signal is the relation, the correlation between each observation. The correlation between all the observations within between each other. So that's uh, why we can use only one signal to train. Yeah. You know, if that is clear. So as I said before, the most important part of the model is the kernel, so how to choose the proper one, how to build the proper one. Uh, that's, uh, we can uh, get that, uh, having clear what are the properties of the signal we want, we want to model, and how to reflect those properties in the covariance function. So we focus now on how to get a covariance function that has or describes some properties of music signals. <coughs> Uh, here we address uh, the three, these three uh, properties of audio signals, the noise stationarity, we should reach spectral content and time dynamics or locally, periodic and non-constant amplitude envelope. Uh, the first property we address is the noise stationary behavior. Um, before introducing that, is, uh, I need to uh, to show, to present two very, very useful properties of the kernels. So the first one, the special five, uh, if we have a valid kernel, K1, K1, and we multiply it in this way by any deterministic function, we get a valid kernel. <coughs> also, if we have two valid kernels, K1 and K2, and we sum them, we, can, we, we obtain again a, a valid kernel. So we build non-stationary uh, covariance functions by, uh, by combining uh, stationary, basic stationary covariance functions. To do that, we introduce change windows. Uh, um, a change window corresponds to the multiplication of two sigmoid functions. So uh, the specific form of this uh, the, of the function phi, I mean, the function phi is going to have this specific form. So here we have uh, four examples of uh, a change window where the onset and the offset uh, are keep the same, but we change the parameter uh, bar sigma. Here, the, this parameter that defines how 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 fast the the function uh, rise to one or uh, falls to, to zero. Uh, in order to illustrate uh, 
the methodology we are implementing uh, here, uh, there is an example of a uh, two-change window of non stationary model. Here we aim to model a function that has two sum events or that present two different behaviors. So we say that the complete signal or function, sorry, the complete function is made or uh, can be expressed as a combination of two subprocess F1 and F2, and each subprocess is weighted by a change window. So using the Gaussian process framework, we say that the general process follows LGP with a covariance function KF, and also we assume that each subprocess follows a GP with a different covariance function K1 and K2. Uh, it can be it it can be shown that the covariance function or the complete process is a linear combination of of the covariant function of the subprocess one and the and the kernel of the subprocess two, uh, each one weighted by its corresponding change window. Uh, this expression. Now I'm going to show different examples and draws for uh, using this model. So expression eleven was uh, used for three different configurations, and um, uh, we use different window size and different type of parameters for the kernel. Here we assume that the covariant function k2 and k1, k1 sorry, have uh, this, this general form. I will, I will go back to this expression later and give more details. So, in, in the first example, we have, as I said, two change windows and there is a sudden change. There is not, a, there is not a very much overlapping between each of the change windows. By using this configuration um, uh, and the kernels and the kernel I saw, I, uh, we, we saw before, we can calculate this covariant matrix. And using this covariant matrix and assuming a zero mean vector, we can draw functions. Or, 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 okay, we can draw vectors from this normal distribution and get something like this. So here we have a function that before 0 0.5 has a certain behavior, maybe with low frequency in relation with, th with this one, and then suddenly the function changed to something that has more harmonics and a higher frequency. So we see here a non-stationary behavior. <coughs> in this case, there is a complete overlapping between the two change windows um, that affects the covariant matrix we get and also the realizations of the functions we we, we can uh, we can draw. We here see, we, we we see here that there is a certain behavior. Then something happens. Something changes doing because of this uh, because of the process that appears in the center of the function. And then uh, again, uh, this behavior vanishes, and the other behavior continues. So. The function goes back to what uh, to his his initial its initial behavior. Uh, the, 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 in, in this example, the, there is there is more overlapping between the change windows, and the change windows has a, a, a soft a soft uh, uh, a soft change. Um, again, this is the covariance matrix we get using these change windows and. Uh, the kernel I, I, we saw before, and if we draw a realization using now that covariant matrix, we get something like this. So we see something that uh, doesn't really uh, have has oscillations, but the oscillation began to to increase, and then we get a completely uh, uh, periodic function. So if we want to model M uh, notes or M uh, music uh, um, some events or notes, we can define a general expression for the complete process as a linear combination of uh, M subprocess, each subprocess weighted by a change window. If we assume independence between each of the subprocess, then we can express the complete covariant function 
as this, as a linear combination of the covariance function of each of the subprocess weighted by the change window in this way. The second property we, uh, we aim to, this, to, to, to be able to describe is the rich spectral content of these kind of signals. As I said before, we assume that each of the subprocess is stationary. A random process is stationary in the, in the wide sense if its mean is constant and if, and if its covariance function only depends on the difference between t and t prime. We will call this difference tau. So because we know that our process, our subprocess uh, have, have this property, we can use the uh, wiener kinchin theorem uh, that says that the spect spectral density of a white sense stationary process corresponds to the Fourier transform of the covariance function. So if we have the covariance function of a process, we can, we can get its spectral density. And uh, if, if we have the spectral density of a process, we can recover the covariance function. So this allows us to make a frequency uh, domain analysis of these kernels and compare them in order to choose uh, a kernel or a covariance function that is more appropriate for describing which, which spectral content. To illustrate this, uh, here uh, we compare two different covariance functions. The first one is a cosine uh, kernel, a very basic covariance function. Uh, let's remember that tau is t minus t prime. Um, also, we compare the cosine kernel with an exponentiated cosine uh, covariance function. <coughs> uh, figure A correspond to draw the covariance function as a, uh, as a function of tau. If we get its covariant, its Fourier transform, obviously we're going to have only one component in four hairs, uh, in minus uh, four hairs. If we, if we draw samples from this Gaussian process, then what we will get is uh, periodic signals with frequency uh, four hertz uh, with a constant amplitude. Um, uh, okay, what, 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 what can change between the realizations are the phase and the amplitude of the signal. The, 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 uh, the frequency is, is going to be the same. Uh, in the second row, we have the exponentiated cosine kernel as a function of tau. Um, if we make the Fourier transform of, of this kernel, we get something, we get this. So we, we, we see that there is a, a very high DC component. There is a component in, 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 in sorry, here is six, in six hertz, and then we have some harmonics. So this uh, covariance function seems to reflect better the content, the harmonic content of music signals. If we draw different realizations using this covariance function, we get functions like this. So we see that they, they are periodic, but they, 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 they don't have only one component. They have more harmonics also. Um, in, later, we will see that these functions only have a, a constant maximum amplitude. Um, this could be a, a drawback. Uh, the last uh, property uh, we present here uh, about how, how to address, how to get uh, how to be able to describe uh, this property is the uh, time dynamics. Is the time dynamics. So, as we saw before, the exponentiated cosine kernel is uh, only can describe uh, functions that have a constant maximum amplitude or a constant uh, amplitude envelope. Uh, here, we relax that property of the kernel but multiplying it with a uh, exponential quadratic kernel. So it's basically the, the same of the previous one, is this behavior. 
but we see that there is a decay, an exponential decay in the correlation between the observation. Uh, for a value for the hyperparameter L, this one, equal to 0 0.1, we have this expression in time, or for tau. Um, if, we have, if we get the, its real transform, we have this expression, and we, if we uh, draw samples for, for this, uh, using this covariant function, we get uh, realizations like this. Uh, we see that these functions are, are very uh, weakly. Um, maybe they, they, they look like maybe noise, so maybe to noise, we cannot see a very clear structure here. If we modify the hyperparameter L to 10, we recover all, almost the same kernel as before. We, uh, we see that the, its properties in the frequency domain uh, keeps uh, almost the same. And we see that the functions we get with this covariance, with this, with this kernel, are also uh, has uh, <coughs> Uh, a fundamental frequency and harmonics, but the amplitude doesn't need to be uh, constant in all, the, uh, in all the space. So the amplitude envelope can change in time. Uh, so what's the difference between the red and blue observation? There are just two different examples that are generated from yeah, the a, yeah, you can see this is a generative model, and this corresponds to a realization. Or we have to sample from this distribution. Uh, finally, uh, sorry, next, uh, I present uh, uh, the results we, we, we obtain uh, in some experiments using synthetic and real audio uh, data. Uh, the synthetic data uh, consists on three realizations of a Gaussian process using the, the two change windows model presented previously. Uh, these are the properties of the, of the these are the parameters we, we choose for the, for, for the three different realizations. So we have two change, two change windows, the first one, the second one. Uh, here are the onsets and the offset of each one. Um, we assume that we know everything but the omega hyperparameter. So that's why we are uh, trying to uncover from the data. Uh, yeah, uh, so because we only need to find two parameters for each uh, sample, we can draw the marginal likelihood because it's going to be a function of only two variables. So we can see how the optimization process goes. Uh, <coughs> the real audio data set, uh, which used the first six seconds of Blank uh, of Blank Chicken 37 by Buenavista Social Club. Uh, this is because we only have one instrument here, and uh, correspond to a bass melody. Um, the aim is to to model the complete signal, but so far. We have been able only to model the first 0 0.7 seconds of this. I mean, the first three uh, song events. This is because uh, if, if we make if we make late, late larger of the time series, then the matrix we need to invert become bigger. So that's one problem we need to to, to address. <coughs> How large is the matrix? Sorry. How large is the matrix? Uh, I don't remember exactly. Should it be I point seven times the sampling rate? I, it's, it's less than for, for for one of the results is that is less than four thousand, and in the other one I think it's eight thousand. So, so it's not going to be seven times the point seven. It's not going to be point seven. Sir? Will it be 0.7 times? Yeah, so only, only the first 0 0.7 seconds of this signals is, is less than this, only this section. And we use this emission to reduce the sample frequency also. Uh, so here is the, the score of this 
and music signal, audio signal. Uh, these are the results uh, obtained <coughs> with the synthetic data. Uh, as I said, the marginal likelihood is a function of two of the two uh, parameters we are, look, we are trying to, to uncover. Um, these are the frequencies of each of the uh, the frequencies of each of the uh, behaviors we have in, in the in the signal. So uh, here we have. Uh, here, uh, there is not a big overlapping between the two, the two change windows, so there is a sudden change in the behavior of the signal. The, that, the, the black uh, dots correspond to the data we want to fit, and the blue, the blue line correspond to uh, the posterior mean of the model. So, uh, at the beginning, we, can, we calculate the posterior mean uh, Using the parameters, some hyperparameters that we choose to initialize the, the process, and we get that. And after the optimization process, we find the uh, minimum, the global minimum, and that means that we find the, the proper or the actual frequency that is seven and three uh, that are in the in the in the signal, and we see that the posterior mean fits properly the data. Uh, this uh, exactly fitting happens before because here we are trying, we are training the model we use to generate this sample. So yeah, that's why it's a toy, toy example. Uh, here we have a complete overlapping between the two change windows. Uh, again, this course, the, the, the dark dots correspond to the observations and the blue line, the posterior mean in iteration zero and maybe four. Um, Okay, so the black uh, line corresponds to the optimization path. Uh, here is it's not very, yeah, not very clear. Uh, also, from from the marginal likelihood, we can we can see that there is a lot of uh, minim, uh, local minimum. And maybe this 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 points. So. Uh, <coughs> So the optimization is highly dependent on the initialization. This is uh, finally the, la the last example using uh, uh, synthetic data. So uh, here there is a, a smooth change in the behavior. So we have something with low frequency. And we can see here also the low frequency uh, behavior and some some high frequency components also, and at the end only the high frequency uh, components. Uh, again, we see that using a proper initialization point, we can go directly to the uh, global minimum and get a good fit of the data. What's the Data, this should be time and then the value of the function of the yes, data. But that, means, that means that each point is there in the part is a sample, the exact sample of the discrete signal. Yeah. Yeah. How long does each iteration take? Uh, I think for, for this is fast, uh, maybe a minute or less. It also depends on the size of the yeah. uh, updating in the plugin. Uh, now I present uh, the results. Uh, we obtained it using uh, real uh, audio. As I said, we are trying to model this first 0 0.7 seconds that corresponds to three sound events. Uh, we frame each event in a different change window. <laughs> And again, we focus on learning 
the natural frequency uh, of each event. So here we have the, the results uh, obtained using the exponentiate cosine kernel. And as we saw before, uh, one of the drawbacks of this kernel is that only can describe uh, functions that has a maximum, uh, a constant maximum amplitude. Uh, after certain quantity of iterations, the model can uh, uncover the frequency, the natural frequency of each of the nodes but is not able to follow uh, the amplitude envelope. Uh, on the other hand, these are the results obtained uh, using the modified exponentiate cosine kernel. Uh, because we allow the model to, think, to be more flexible about the kind of signals that can describe, uh, we see that after the iteration 65, the posterior mean is able to follow the amplitude envelope of the signal and also can uncover the natural frequency of each of the nodes. These results are using uh, 4,410 Hz sample frequency. Uh, here we show the, the results that were the posterior mean uh, using the exponentiate cosine kernel uh, times the square exponential, uh, but for a signal with uh, the double of the sample frequency. Uh, here we can see that the posterior mean can follow the behavior of the amplitude envelope and can also follow the natural frequency of the signal. Uh, finally, we compare different covariant function uh, in a missing, missing data <coughs> in filling gaps of missing data. Uh, what, what we do, uh, what we did was to, uh, to take the first two uh, sound events of the real audio and make uh, two gaps in each of the events. So uh, the uh, B figure correspond to a zoom in in the gap in the first event. And uh, this, the, the figure C corresponds to, uh, to, to zoom in the second gap in the second event. Uh, these results are, uh, were obtained using a square exponential kernel. Um, we see that, that the posterior mean can follow, uh, we can say perfectly, uh, the observations. Oh, sorry. Uh, I need to specify something before. So the, 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 the black line corresponds to the observation, we are uh, the, the available observations, and the dark, uh, the dark points correspond to the to the uh, to the point to the data we are omitting or to the gap, and the blue line corresponds to the prediction of the model. So here we see that the, the model fee, uh, follows perfectly the signal, but in the section where we don't have observations, it, 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 it makes a, a, a poorly prediction. He say, okay, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what's going on here, so I will assume that what happens here is a mean, so only a, C, a zero function. So it's been trained on the data with that question missing? Uh, no, with all the, all the data. Oh, okay. I mean, this, this two. And then you remove a question, and then you... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. This is a, a vector, and I omit one section here and one section here. So that was the test, the, the data for test, and the remaining parts of the vector was the training uh, based database. Did you just pull it yeah. together? Okay. Uh, these are the results using the uh, exponentiated cosine kernel. Uh, again, we see that the posterior mean doesn't follow the amplitude envelope, but in the gaps, assume it's a periodic behavior. So it makes a better prediction of what's, what's going on, what's happening in the, in the gaps. Now, finally, uh, using the uh, exponentiated cosine uh, times the square exponential kernel, uh, 
we, we got these results and we see that the posterior mean can follow the amplitude envelope and can make a, a better prediction about what's, what's happening in the two gaps that we made in the data. Uh, this is because this kernel can describe uh, functions that uh, its amplitude envelope can change. So is it, uh, when, when you use the model with the time interval? Sorry? So, so this is the result with the mo when you use the model with the time interval? Okay. Could you repeat, please? Uh, the, the previous one was uh, when you used the, because the, the yeah. it, in the title, but I can see here. So, so okay, so it's here it is, uh, yeah, the first and second one. Using this one. Yeah, uh, okay. So uh, the last one is using this one. So with and with the time interval. Sorry. Yeah, that allows to to follow the amplitude and the okay, so finally I will talk about future work. So this is a research that is ongoing and I think that maybe the title of the seminar is too ambitious, but there are a lot of tasks that need to be to be done yet. Uh, so the first one is here we assume that we know how many how many events were the signal. <coughs> and we suppose also that we, we knew the the, par the, the the parameters, the values of the parameters of these change windows. So I think it's necessary also to infer from the data how many events are there and the properties of the change windows. Also, uh, alternative kernels for describing harmonic spectral content can be analyzed. Uh, there are other, uh, there are more options about how to uh, how to describe this property. Uh, also, uh, latent force models uh, can be implemented or added in the model in, in this approach. Uh, in order to model mechanistic properties. So a, a, latent for, a latent force model is basically a combination of a Gaussian process and a differential equation. So we, by this, we can introduce uh, physical law properties in the functions we, we, we are generating on or uh, modeling. Uh, also, um, very important is uh, we, we are looking, we, are, we seek to introduce music structure in the kernel, how to, how to be able to, to describe functions that has some temporal structure and also uh, uh, a structure in frequency, how to, how to introduce rhythm patterns or uh, a relation of uh, uh, sound uh, or of, sorry, or how to generate notes that follow a tonality or a chore that follows certain uh, harmony. Uh, we, 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 we seek that by introducing music structure in the kernel. Uh, as we saw, we, we, have a, uh, we have to deal with the size of the matrix we, we are uh, working. So we need to find an efficient representation for GPs in order to use, it, use them in large time series for in real uh, audio, real audio signals with more than 0 0.7 seconds of duration. Um, finally, uh, we think that it's quite important to, to include prior information using music information retrieval algorithms because the optimization process is quite dependent on the initialization. So we can use uh, several algorithms to have a, a prior idea about the music concepts and use those, uh, that, that prior as an initialization point in the optimization. So thank you so much.